Okay, <clears throat> so welcome to lesson two of this Beginner's Kabbalah course. Tonight, we're talking about the Kabbalah of wealth. We're talking about money. It, it's funny because it seems like a paradox. The Kabbalah of wealth, Kabbalah and wealth. So if I say the word money, what's the first word that comes to mind? Anyone? Evil. Evil. Material. Material. That which we don't bring to the other side. I see in the chat box overabundance. Secular. Work. Work. I was gonna say status. I think people status. Have money. Status. Yeah. I was saying secular. Secular. Great. That's interesting that you're defining um, secular yeah. as opposed to religious. I see in the chat box comfort. Uh, I see opportunity. So it seems to me just from the group that we have here tonight, there are so many different words and adjectives that come to mind when we even say the word wealth or we say the word money. So what do we use money for? Buy things we want. To buy things we want. We need it to live. We need it to live. To be able There's to uh, somewhere in the Tanakh that says uh, money answers all things. Okay, somewhere in the Tanakh. According to Dennis, money answers all things. I like that. To be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Okay, so that freedom to be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Charity, I see. I see in the chat box access. It's a tool for exchange. A tool for exchange. I like that. Knowledge, uh, power, value. A lot of big thinking words when we think about what we use money for. So many big thinking words. Freedom. Um, using the word money. Now, what I want to do tonight is I want to look at money, but also look at our personal narrative, our personal perception of money, and see if we can take our perspectives and then build on them. And possibly, I'm not saying this is a for sure, but possibly even change them. So let's, let's get started. When, when you think about money, do you get excited? Do you get uplifted? Do you get depressed because of the amount of money that maybe is in your bank account right now? What's your reaction, your personal reaction to money? Where does money come from? Money sometimes can come at the expense of another. I hear people say, time is money. I've heard that a lot. So people associating time with money. There's nothing in our world today that I believe is more worshipped than money. It's become the root of good, the root of evil, and it could be that money is an incredible thing, and it could be that money is used for something that's not good. Now, let's take a look at what an idol is. An idol is uh, something that you worship. According to the Torah, we would call it a false god. In, in, in the second of the top 10 of the Ten Commandments, the original top 10, it says, do not worship molten images, do not worship false gods. It's interesting because it says, because I'm a jealous god. Well, we'll talk about that at a different time. Now, if I were to say, that money equals idolatry, what would you say? I agree. I agree. I think it's true to a certain extent. Depends on if you worship it or not. You know, if you, if you, if, if, how, how high up in your, in your priority list it is. Yeah. Right. I disagree. You disagree? Yeah. Why? Money may be a challenge, it comes and goes, but 
I, I, I don't think it's an idol for me. I, it's, it's a necessary evil. It's part of what I need to move forward, but it, I do not intend to be a, a reach or whatever. It's, so that's interesting. You're calling it a necessary evil, but not an idol. Okay. Rob, I, I find that uh, we worship, I, I think that we worship it because we, we tend to, uh, you know, give deference to those who have a lot of money and a lot of things are allowed to people who have a lot of money. And, and so it becomes, you know, um, people place their whole value system on money. And so it leads to a lot of other things. You know, if, if you value only money, then you value only people with money, then you value only status symbols, then you value only, you know, big, you know, fancy cars and big fancy houses. And so it, it's sort of all connected for me. And, and if COVID has ta taught us anything, is the value of no value. <laughs> Money has no value. <laughs> and that's, it's, it's amazing that you're saying that and, and that, you're, that you're putting money in the same context as, as almost like you, it's allowing us to do or not to do or to experience or not to experience. So I want to take a look a little bit different. So let's take a, a Kabbalistic look. I'm going to ask a question that is not loaded. I mean, it could be loaded, but it won't be tonight. What is God? And I'm going to answer it like this. God is the following. Is putting our trust in God or in something, we'll call it something, that is trustworthy. So a false God is putting our trust in something that is not trustworthy. Just think about that a second. I agree. It's the same way as when, you know, people who, who worship, you know, little, I don't know, little statues and stuff like that. You know, it has no inherent value, has no, it, it can't possibly move mountains and, you know, cause the, the world to exist. So it, it, money is exactly the same. I mean, let me give you, let me give you an example just to put it into context, as Maurice is saying. Um, I have something to tell you, and uh, it's very difficult for me to say this, but, um, and I know it's gonna be hard for you to understand this, but you see this, this phone here? Um, it created me. And uh, yeah, it's, it created me, and I'm going to worship it forever. I will worship this phone, it's who I am. I look up to it as much as I can. Um, I will call it my God and I will bow to it. <laughs> there, are, there are people who used to take a stone from the ground and they would say, this is my God. They, there were people who used to worship the dust at their feet. They would worship the stars in the sky. It's incredible. Today, I think being as enlightened as we are, it's hard for us to even think that there's a possibility that somebody could say the stone on the ground created them. That's insane. We're much smarter than that. So the Rebbe once said that we cannot truly understand the desire that people had for idolatry, for worshiping uh, stones and dust and stars, People had a tremendous desire. It was desire of that particular era, like we have desires of our era today that maybe they would never understand. But it was, there was uh, a Rabbi, tremendous... if I should uh, interject, um, yeah. in, in, in my native country, that is nothing unusual because uh, there's a, a large ethnic group. They worship idols, and I'm not referring to anything Christian. I'm referring to people who are from the East. And um, they are an extremely wealthy and educated ethnic group. So to many of us in the Caribbean, it's not, un it's not unusual. I mean, it's, it's bizarre, but it's something that we live with every day. No, I, so I, think... I don't know if it's because of, um, of maybe your North American, Canadian American point of view, where you all are not accustomed having these ethnic and religious groups close by, 
that it may seem unusual, but us in the Caribbean, especially in, in my country, we see it every day. Yeah, it's a very good point that you have. Very, very good point. Uh, Alessandra, you have your hand raised. Please. What, what do you make of uh, Lucky Charms then? <clears throat> lucky Charms are exactly that. I mean, even in Judaism, we have uh, Lucky Charms. Yeah, we, we, we do have it, but we have to be careful because there's a fine line between, I don't know, a segula, what that we call it, and maybe a Lucky Charm, where you actually give it a certain uh, godlike reverence. To say, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, but it's a very good point that you bring up. So let's go back to this for a moment. Putting your trust in something that's not trustworthy. You know, belief in God is a new idea. If you look at the Torah and you talk about the biblical characters, you know, Adam spoke to God. Noah, I mean, we all know the story of Noah. God comes to Noah and says, he says, build an ark. And Noah's like, are you talking to me? But the point is, is that he's having a conversation with God. He's not asking God, do you exist? He's not asking God, where are you? He's speaking to God and asking God, what's a cubit? He's asking God, how high do you want this ark? Abraham is talking to God. Moses is talking to God. These people have real relationships with God. It's why, and I'm going to sidetrack for a moment, there's been some conversation amongst various rabbis who are saying that this COVID is a punishment that has come to us. And my response to them amongst many is, God hasn't spoken to us in 3,000 years. You think he's going to start speaking to us now? All of a sudden, it's a punishment? I mean, that's absolutely absurd. For anyone to, to start putting a very specific word or idea on God right now is defeating the entire purpose. I mean, if you go back, yes, if you're talking about the plagues in Egypt, if you're talking about the people who saw the crossing of the Sea of Reeds, who saw open miracles, then we can talk about the conversation of uh, plague or no plague. That's not us. The fact that we are here tonight and we are having a Torah lesson, we are talking Kabbalah, we are talking spiritual ideas, three and a half thousand years after God stopped speaking, that we're even talking about belief and faith, I think is an absolute miracle. It's a miracle because there's absolutely no reason for us in our right mind to even try to have a relationship with God. So if we're having even an iota of a relationship with God, I think that that alone is incredible. The fact that maybe every so often we're gonna look up and we're gonna pray, or maybe we're gonna light the Shabbat candles or do something Jewish during this time is an amazing thing. We're not Abraham, we're not Noah. We're not having conversations. All of a sudden, something changed in the world. It says that in the days of Enosh, and this is during the times of the Bible, the people made a mistake. They started saying that just like a king has ministers and the king appoints the ministers and gives the ministers the same power as the king, the ministers can appoint ministers to do many things. So the same way a king has ministers and appoints this power, God appoints this power to the sun and the moon and the stars. And people started worshiping the constellations, the horoscope, saying that God appointed these deities to teach us and to direct us. And that was the first step away from belief in God or away from the relationship with God. And then... These people went a step further and said that God wants us to worship these deities, that God wants us to worship the constellations, that God wants us to worship the moon and the sun. And later, they went so far as to say the stars and the moon and the sun actually want us to worship it, and they are the creator. And so you can see how 
a, maybe what Dennis was saying before, how a level-headed intellectual can possibly, through a process, a gradation, can possibly see where it comes from belief in God to believing in a rock, a stone, or even the dust of our feet. And it's so easy, I think, to, to misconstrue belief. I mean, at first you say, well, I mean, how can someone worship this phone? We know it's an iPhone. It was made by, it was designed by Apple in California and produced in China. We know this. It says it right on the back of it. It didn't create me. But if you see the chronology, you can see first it's God who appointed this for us to worship. And then God wants us to worship. And then the third is it wants us to worship it. So once you can see how this pattern happens and how idolatry was created in the world, in a, in a world that maybe we have a very difficult time understanding, but today we have new forms of idolatry. And the new form of idolatry that we have today is money. There's many, but I believe that in the 21st century, in our world today, there's no idolatry like money. Julia is saying, how does the phone want us to worship it? It doesn't have feelings. It's true. It doesn't have feelings. But the, does the sun and the moon and the stars, the rock have feelings? I'm saying it, it, it's just, it's, it, it, it's a simple chronology of how you can go from one to another. To go from believing in God to saying that the phone created me, that would be insane. But there is a process of how that can happen. One of the things, and people say, there was a lot of reasons why the Rebbe used to stand, the Rebbe used to stand for hours on Sunday and give out dollars. The, the Rebbe wasn't able to have personal audiences because there was too many people. So that what the Rebbe did was, the Rebbe would stand and give out dollars. And the Rebbe's philosophy in giving the dollars was that when two people meet, something good should happen for a third and that the people should take that dollar and give it to charity. But I also recently heard that the Rebbe was very proud of the fact that the $1 bill in the United States said on the back of it, in God we trust. And it's interesting that it does say on the back of the dollar bill in the United States, in God we trust. And I also think kind of humorously that that's become God. It's like, in this God, in this dollar bill, we've come to trust. We, we worship the dollar bill like none other. We think like it. We say words like time is money. Time is not meaningful. Time is not important. Time is money. We think in terms of money. We look at people's status. There are people who work three jobs so they can keep up a certain status or they'll go into debt to who knows how much to keep a certain status. So people can think or they can give the illusion that they have money so they can keep up. I used to call it the Joneses. I don't even know what they call it anymore. The whole Joneses business. If I think that there's one, again, I, I, I wrote this before, COVID, but I, I am connecting it because it's something that's really in our lives right now. If there's so many things that we can think about during this time, but if we can think out about what money really means to us, what is really important to us, the amount of time that we're spending with our families or with, with, with just doing internal work, all of these things, they, they need to, we need to come out of this time different than we came into it. We can't allow this to be happening to us. And then when it's all over, forget it ever happened. And the only way that's going to happen is if right now we start thinking about what is going to be when we come out of this, how we're going to look at things differently. And imagine, just imagine for a moment, if we looked at money differently. So if you open up your course book, you'll see on page nine, I put there five things that I've learned from money. And I want to go through those five things now. So page nine in your course book, you can follow along with me, or you can just listen if you'd like. Number one, I learned that money is a fiction. 
I learned that money is not real. Money is a useful fiction. It's even a productive fiction, but it isn't real. All it is is a commonly held consensus that a digital record stored in the computers of some financial institution or the equity of a certain property registered in our name represents the value of X in goods and services. We build further fictions upon this fiction, like the fiction of an anticipated return from an investment, or more fictions upon those fictions, like the fiction of the leverage value of an anticipated return on investment. Some financial wizards have succeeded in perpetuating the fiction of money to the fifth or sixth or seventh degree. But no matter how many times you layer over the fiction, it's still fiction. And what that consensus unravels when the collective confidence in the fiction of money begins to slip, then we're left with nothing. So you see, here's the problem. The false gods, our, our, our idols are not trustworthy. Money is not trustworthy. They've let us down. They haven't held up. They're not real. They have no power of their own. The, pr the problem that people had with saying the stars and the moon are like the ministers of the king was that the analogy that they used to give, the stars and the moon are like the ministers of the king, the problem with that is the ministers of the king have their own choice. So the fact that they've chosen to be the ministers of the king, we give them a little bit of respect, and that makes sense to us. But the stars and the moon and the sun, they had absolutely no choice of their own. There's nothing about them that's their own. Money has no choice of its own. It's going to let us down because it's a false god. We can't trust in something that's not trustworthy. We can't put our energy into something that's not trustworthy. See, I think it's funny because generations ago, our grandparents, they knew this. You know how I know? Because a lot of them were very wealthy in the old country and they came here because they were forced to come here. And when they came here, they had to leave everything. Could you imagine, just imagine for a moment, leaving everything in the old country, everything you've built up, whatever they had, all they could take with them was maybe if they were lucky, a small suitcase, if they were lucky. So they understood this. They understood the true value of money, that money was meaningless. I think they should have known better. I think they should have taught us this. They didn't manage to teach us this. Many of them came to this country and they went back to do the same exact thing. Oh, they would say, this country is a good country. The people here are kind. We don't have to worry anymore. No one's gonna chase us out because of communism or totalitarianism or whatever is gonna happen. It's a good place. And so therefore many of them became wealthy once again, but they failed to teach us the value of money that they had inherently. They were willing to give everything up for life. That's incredible. That's unbelievable. And I think that if we just look at their actions, we can learn from them. Thank God we live in a country, it's a good country, it is a kind country, and they were 100% right for coming here. They did good to us, for us. But now what are we left with? We're left with a, a certain emptiness. So if we're re-looking and re-evaluating the value of money, maybe one way of doing it is looking at them and thinking, what would I give up for money? Let me change the subject a bit. What's true? If I were to say the word truth, 
what comes to mind? What is true? That which is eternal, doesn't change. That which is eternal, that which doesn't change. Of course. Well, then it's in, indisputable or beyond question? Indisputable, beyond question. But we all have our views and perception. What is true to me is not true to you. So they can be fluctuating. We have our own truths. And I can say that. Sorry. No, but how is it true? If it's fluctuating, how is it true? There we go. We can even question someone else's truth. But you know, there's a there's a drawing which is funny. You, you have a dice, and on one hand you have a six, on the other hand you have a three. What do you see? I see a six, and you see a three. We're both right. That's right. So but there's different truths. The yeah. With different people. So if we had to define a truth, here we are. We're on Zoom. We're having a discussion. We're trying to feel like we're in person, but it's it's hard. And if we would say that there's something that is, as Michael said, an eternal truth, that it was eternal, that, that, that doesn't change. Because if something is true today, but it's not gonna be true tomorrow, is it really true? I, I, I think that something that is true and cannot be changed. It's such an important level of truth. It's something that is, is constant. It's the same in, in all places, in all times. It's constant. Tell me something in our lives that is constant, that is the same in all places, in all times, that it's an eternal, non-changing truth. Love. Love? Hashem. Okay, Hashem. Taxes. Taxes. Oxygen. Oxygen. We, um, we have a new uh, feeling towards oxygen over the past uh, year. <laughs> we have a new love. We have a new currency. It's called oxygen. Absolutely. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom. Hashem, I see over here. Mm -hmm. I would say the fact that the heart beats and keeps us alive. Yeah, the heart, the heart beating that's keeping us alive. Well, then I'll say death. Death, death and taxes. Exactly. <laughs> it's always constant. My connection with Hashem, or our connection. Oh, our, our relationship with Hashem, that's interesting. Yeah. It can be fluctuating. Yes. Well, just a minute. The relationship, I just made it, your connection with Hashem is... You can be as atheist as you want to be. You cannot ha not have a connection with Hashem. Yes. But do we know that? Do we but know can... that? Yes, I'll tell you why. Because if the, the opposite of, 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 of um, love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifferent. If someone was truly an atheist, they just wouldn't care. They would just be indifferent. Maybe they would call it agnostic. I don't know what they call it. But someone who is so adamantly... Anti-God, it must mean that God exists. Hmm. You can't be but, anti something that doesn't exist. Yeah, but no, ma but no matter what somebody's perspective is, that is over and above everything. It's just, it's just that. Yes, yeah, I, I was just, <laughs> just that. It's not up for debate. I mean, wh whether somebody believes it, buys it, how much they put attention on Hashem, their right. connection with Hashem, all of that is very variable and relative. But I mean... <laughs> I mean, the table, the table story that you teach is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so let's think about it. If, if I have a certain core belief or a core truth, we're going to call it a truth. If I have a core truth and I add to that truth, is it still true? Well, let's take example. I'm going to give you uh, the Torah. I, I consider the Torah, at least for me, a core truth. If I have a, a, a tor the Torah, and I add to it. Is it still the same core truth? Oh, Let's say uh, one day I say, you know what? I, I don't like this verse. I'm going to take out this verse and I'm going to put in this one. It makes more sense to me. Is it still true? But don't yeah. you do that with interpretations on the Torah? No, it's yeah. not constant. No, but, and, and 
and true is is a hundred percent wholeness thing. So if you have ninety nine point nine 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 percent true and then not true, it's not true. It's not true. Just like if you have a liter of water and you put and it's the best water ever, but you put one drop of strychnine in it, it becomes poison. All right. twenty thousand other drops are become that one poison. It's interesting how um, similar to Corona, I, I I was trying to explain the whole idea of the virus to my kids. And I took a, a white piece of paper and I put a black dot in it. And I asked them, what do you see? And they said, the black dot. And I said, well, I see a white piece of paper. I see the, the there's so many, there's, there's a thousand other little dots on this paper that are all white. But somehow we focus on the one black dot and not on the white paper. So, and it's amazing that you have something that you can barely see. You can see under a microscope, but it takes over as if it's the only thing that exists. So, so what Michael was saying, if you have 99.9% .9 truth, but you have 0.01% not true, it's not true. If you add to the Torah, if you say, well, I, I don't like this verse, I'm going to put in my own verse, then you have a 2020 version, not a 2020, but a 2020 version of the Torah. It's not the same Torah that we've had for 3,000 years. And the reason why the Torah is true is because we've had the Torah for 3,000 years. It hasn't been changed. It hasn't been altered. And what was amazing is that we always said that. The rabbis always said that, oh, the Torah is true. Uh, it hasn't been changed or altered. Not one letter has been different. And, and people said, how do you know that? How are you so sure that the Torah was never changed? And then... Some Bedouin kid in the Negev desert found a clay jar and opened it up and found some scrolls and sold it to somebody else who ended up selling it to someone else. And now it sits in the, the, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. They call it the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they compared some of the texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls to the texts that we have been reading for 3,000 years. And there was not one letter different. It's amazing. Through all the persecution, through everything that's happened to us as a people, where the Torah has been, only God knows. How many places and times, I mean, we have a Torah in our shul that pieces of the Torah were wrapped around, a woman wrapped around her waist and fled Europe with it during the Holocaust. And then she ended up um, donating those pieces. And we, uh, as a community, got a scribe. We hired a scribe to put together the other pieces. And, and it's a Torah that we use. I mean, where, where the Torah has been is unbelievable. And that we can then compare a document that archaeologists say is indeed 3,000 years old with the Torah that we have carried with us through the most difficult times and we can say not one letter has changed. There's 304,806 letters in the five books of Moses. And not one letter has changed. It's just something to marvel at. Something that we have in our arsenal that exists, a truth that exists that we can only marvel at. That not one letter has changed. And not only that, that the amount of time the painstaking time it takes a, a scribe over a year to write it on parchment with a special kind, with a quill, still the same way it was written 3,000 years ago, it is written today. And if one letter is missing or one letter is broken, it cannot be used. Every letter needs to be there. Every single letter not only has to be there, but not one of them can be cracked. And there's so many amazing lessons about how we each have a letter of a Torah and if one of us is, is cracked or if one of us is sick and one of us is broken, then it affects the entire whole or if one of us is missing, it affects the entire whole. One of the great examples is uh, right after the Holocaust, the, a lot of rabbis were saying the year after the Holocaust that uh, at the Passover Seder, they should leave a, a chair empty to remember the six million. And the Rebbe was very upset about that. He said, why are we leaving a chair empty? Instead of leaving the chair empty, we should go out and find someone who doesn't have a Seder to fill that chair. 
that would be much more of a of a, a remembrance for the 6,000 that were martyred, that were killed on uh, sanctifying God's name than having a chair empty at the Seder. And since then, anyone who has heeded the Rebbe's advice, myself included, will make sure that everyone has a Seder to go to on Passover because that is the great way that the Jewish people remember. We make sure that not one letter can be missing. Not one letter can be cracked. If someone doesn't have, we have to make sure that they have. That's our responsibility because we are all part of a whole. And that is what the Torah represents. Now, back to our conversation. If you add to the truth, if you add to the Torah, it becomes false. Now, tell me something else in the world that has not been redone, recreated, reconstrued, reevaluated, re, 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 that you can't put a re in front. Give me an example of anything that has not been changed or updated or reconfigured. I mean, if you leave it us, to us humans, especially to us Jews, we will find some way to reconfigure it. That's what's amazing. I mean, there's ingenuity and creativity in our world like none other. But is there anything that has not been changed? Sun and the moon. How do you know? It's hard, it's hard to know. You can say that the moon hasn't been changed, but how do you know? The way we have babies. Maybe. Even Maybe though not. there's many ways to have babies, but they still are made by women. They're so, it's true that they're... Of the time now. <laughs> yeah, it's true that the... That, that the but, but the actual giving birth to babies has changed. I mean, there's so many babies that are born today that even 100 years ago would never have survived. And think, thanks to modern technology, they're, we're able to, to, to keep babies alive in a way that we've never been able to before. But you're right. If you want to talk about the, the actual semantics of it, you're right. But very few things, I think, can, can, can come under this guise. And I think it's amazing because at the end of the day, if we ask ourselves, do we value truth? Of course we value truth. We hate lies. But majority of what we value is not true. Majority of the things that we put so much emphasis on, that we put so much time into, that we put so much effort into are not true. So if I would have seen the only thing in the universe that, has, that is true. And I would say that that has some life lessons about wealth, about money. Maybe it's worth listening. And the one thing I know, I wanna know how to make money quickly, how to get money, right? Because money's my value. And I want that more than anything else, let's just say. I'm not saying for any of us here, but some random person. And so what do we want? We want more money so that we can have more money. So there's more money in my account. So I'm that I'm full of more money. And that way I can do so many more things that I was going to do with the more money that I'm going to have, but I'm going to have no time because I'm going to be busy making the money. So I have so much money and too much money for what? So I have it. I was just about to say, Rabbi, when you get caught up in the game of making more money, to have more money, to see more money, to whatever, you have no time to enjoy exactly. that money. Or you get to an age where you no longer can enjoy that which it can buy you. Because there's a lot of things when you get too old, you just can't do it anymore. Like you can't eat what you want. You cannot go bungee jumping at 85. You, can, you know, like there's just stuff you cannot do. So... It's a false god for sure. Okay. And, and, I, and, and it's so funny, exactly. People, you know, it's a certain sense of security. They're going to keep saving it. And then it's going to be lost in the stock market. Everything we know in our lives is limited to time and space. And the reason why we're so concerned about putting everything into the context of time and space is because of science, because most of us are students of science. And because of 
that science is so concerned about creating confines, about trying to bring it down into this world, into this moment. We're not worried about how the tree started. I mean, we can say things like what came first, the chicken or the egg, but we don't really care. We're just gonna look at the tree today and we're gonna carbon date it based on our carbon dating, whether it's true or it's not true, it doesn't matter. It's going to be our truth. And we're going to say the tree is this and this old. And so because carbon dating is working, and that's the age of the tree based on carbon dating, we're happy that becomes our truth. So, so science, and as students of science, we become accustomed to making and confining everything to time and space. Not only that, but if somebody comes up with an idea today that is not confined to time and space, we're gonna to try to prove it. We're gonna to try to box it. We're gonna to try to put it into the confines of time and space. Otherwise, we're gonna look at them and we're gonna say, you prove it. And what does the notion of prove it even mean? It means that we wanna confine it to time and space. But by doing that, we limit a lot. We actually limit everything. Because if I would just tell you that anything is possible, just say those words, anything is possible, right away your defense mechanism goes up like, whoa, 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 no, not anything, okay? First of all, I have 24 hours in a day. I have to sleep. I have to eat. I may someday have to drive to work. I have things to do, maybe. I used to have places to go. I have people to see on Zoom. I'm confined by time and space. It's very nice of you to say that anything is possible, but tell it to the kids. It's not true. Truth, the Torah, Kabbalah is especially not concerned with time and space. Kabbalah doesn't want us to be concerned with time and space because it doesn't matter. It's obvious to us. Everything we know is connected to time and space. Not only that, but in terms, the terms that Kabbalah uses are anthropomorphic terms. They're just metaphors for grandiose ideas that we would have no idea what they mean because they're not limited by time and space. See, heaven, heaven isn't limited by time and space. The only place that is limited by time and space is this world, is our world. So if our body is the wick and our soul is the flame, our soul is constantly wanting to rise higher. Our body is the wick keeping it rooted in, on the ground, rooted in this plane, rooted in this world but our soul wants to rise higher. And so often we don't allow our souls to rise higher because we limit them without even trying, without even attempting to let the soul grow, to see what it'll be, to see who I am really. Who am I? Uh, Rabbi, may I ask a question here? Sure. I grapple with that dichotomy. We live as human beings in time and space. Yes. And yet we are asked to rise above that within the context of time and space. That's there right. will always be that struggle. It is not as if we are living out of time and space where it would be easier for our soul to, to handle that. It's and, all right. And what's the problem with that struggle? Struggle is huh? great. Struggle yeah, but the Jewish value. But, but there are times, it, well, but that struggle sometimes elicits that feeling as though you're not achieving what you ought to achieve because you're constantly battling within time and space to be in a realm that is not time and space within time and space. And, and what does that do for you? And so if, if saying if, if you, it's about perspective, it's about narrative. So what does that perspective do for you? But it's, it's almost as though you're, you're asking, for instance, let's say it would 
with the reverse. The soul is, the, the body and the soul are living out of time and space. And the body is now asked to live, to understand time and space, but, you know, in a realm that is not time and space. It's, right. it's, it's almost, uh, besides the word I'm looking for, but it's, it almost seems counterintuitive. There are, you will have struggles. No, we're, we're not saying, to see, again, this is the point. We're not saying to go on a mountain and meditate. We're not saying to leave time and space. We're not expecting to, to go to some place, some retreat and, 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 and meditate uh, in, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. what, what we want to do is we want to be within this world, but stay above it. So we're going to use this world. We're going to use time and space, but we're not going to be limited by it. But, but isn't it a case where you're almost about, you're, you're, you're going to fail even before you start because you cannot achieve that success of living within time and space and trying to achieve something that is beyond the time and space. Let me, let me propose something different to you over the course of the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And then afterwards, we will we'll continue this debate because I think it's interesting. Okay? W one of my favorite stories is a story of Rabbi Shner Zaman of Liadi. He was the author of Batanya. He was known as the Alter Rebbe. And I'm not going to go into the reason why, but his, his daughter uh, died young and she left a three-year-old Menachem Mendel, his grandson. And before she passed away, she made her father promise that he would raise the child. And he did. He raised the child. And so one day, the three-year-old is on his lap and he's trying to teach him values as, at three years old. And so he says in Yiddish, Vu is Zeda. Where's grandpa? And the child pointed to the rabbi's nose. And he said, no, 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 that's, that's grandpa's nose. Where's grandpa? And then he points to his eyes. And he says, no, no, that's grandpa's eyes. Where's grandpa? And then he points to his ears. And he says, no, that's grandpa's ears. Where's grandpa? And they continue the conversation. A few minutes later, the grandfather gets up to walk out of the room. And the child screams out, Zayde, grandpa. The grandfather, with all of his essence, turns around to look at the child. The child points and says, that's grandpa. Our spirit, our passion, our soul, that's who we are. And because of our conditioning, we have not been able to allow our soul to shine. We have no idea what our soul really has to say because we haven't allowed it to talk. It's just so easy to stay this way because that's the way it is. But really, we are a fusion of the physical and the spiritual. Just like we have a body and we feed our body, we never go a day without eating, heaven forbid, or maybe an hour, but we have to also feed our soul. Our soul is that wick, and it's constantly like a flame trying to rise higher. And our body, like the wick, is trying to keep it down. So who are we really? Let's go to number two, on page nine. I learned, this is my second lesson, I learned that money is not a measure of worth. A man wakes up in the morning, logs on to his accounts, checks a few numbers and makes a few calculations and reaches the conclusion that as of 7.42 a.m. of this particular day on the calendar that he's worth $50 million or whatever, or 25 cents. And then a certain market halfway across the globe hiccups in a certain way and now he's worth double that. Really? Is he now a better person? Is he now happier? Is he more loving to his family? kinder to strangers, more fulfilled in his heart. And if God forbid the market gives another hiccup and the digits of his portfolio are suddenly half or quarter of what they were yesterday, now he's worth much less. Is that what worth is? When are we going to start, stop judging people by money, by their worth? What do you do for a living? Okay, size you up. How much are you worth? Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, yeah, perfect, that's great. What gets 
us excited in life could be anything. But for some reason, we have become so accustomed in our lives to getting excited by money. So here's my question. Has it ever helped anyone? Has anyone ever been a better person, a kinder person? Now, before answering this question, I want to backtrack, give you a little more Kabbalah. Adam and Eve. Adam is created from dirt. God took dirt and fashioned the man and blew into his nostrils a breath of life. And voila, there's Adam, the first person. So says the Bible, bestseller of all time. Eve, how she created? God takes one of Adam's ribs and creates her. So the lowest place that a person can go in this world is back to our genesis, back to our beginning. Nobody wants to be a baby again. That would be the lowest place we can go back to day one, minute one, second one, moment one. You don't want to be there. We've all grown physically. We've grown emotionally. We've grown mentally. We've matured, most of us. So many things have happened since that first moment. So the worst place for someone to go would be the beginning, which for Adam, which for man is dirt. So man is always concerned about becoming dirt, which is nothing. He's concerned about becoming nothing. And that's why men have this innate desire, according to Kabbalah, to achieve. Men, not women. Now, Kabbalah talks not in gender differences, but rather in male and female energy, that most men have majority male energy and less female, and most women have more majority female and less male. But that's how Kabbalah speaks in, in terms of men and women, but rather male and female energy. So the male energy in the person wants to achieve, wants to prove that it's not dust, that it's not dirt, that it's not nothing. And the opposite of nothing is something. So it wants to prove it's a something. And so it needs to constantly achieve, has to get a certain status, a certain profile, has to build a certain amount of wealth, a car, a nice car, a nice home, et cetera, et cetera. That's the male energy in us. Now, th what's the female energy concerned with? Well, what is the lowest place that the female energy can go? It's becoming him. Need I say more? So the male energy has that need to achieve and accomplish. And we misinterpret that achievement, that accomplishment with money. It's a mistake, it's a huge mistake because really what it wants to do, what it wants to achieve and accomplish is what the soul wants. And what does the soul want to achieve and accomplish in this world? Its purpose here. It wants to be a better person. It wants to be a better father, a better husband, better with others, wants to give, wants to volunteer, wants to make a unique impression in this world. One of the things that fascinated me during the Madoff scandal, I know we all forgot about it by now, but um, there were quite a number of Jews who were part of it. And I remember watching a CNN interview with an elderly couple and they were in their 90s. They had given Madoff all of their life savings. They had nothing left. And obviously, being in their 90s, they couldn't just go in and make money again. They literally had lost everything. And again, I mean, I'm not going to go into who's right and who's wrong and what happened over there. So in the middle of the interview, the interviewer turns to this couple and says, Bernie Madoff right now is sitting in his penthouse apartment in Manhattan watching this interview. Do you have anything to say to him? And the, the elderly man turns to the camera right into the screen and says, Fe. Fe is Yiddish. 
it's such a, this Yiddish is so descriptive. It's such a descriptive term. It means like, how could you belittle yourself to do this? How could you? It means like, I think much greater of you. How could you lead me to this? That's what femme means. Now, contrary to that, I want to tell you another story. This is one of my favorite stories. If you have heard any of my Rosh Hashanah sermons, if you've been to any of my classes, you've probably heard the story at least 10 times by now, but I'm going to say it again because I love it so much. And it wouldn't be right to talk about money without mentioning the story. If, if you know, um, probably the most important Jew of the 19th century was a man by the name of Moses Montefiore, sorry, Sir Moses Montefiore. If you go to anywhere in the world, you're going to find a Montefiore something in almost every Jewish community in the world. I mean, and, and this man was so philanthropic. This man was such a big giver. Even here in Canada, there's quite a few places that are named after him that he had given uh, um, a lot of money to. The world famous Montefiore Medical Center in New York carries his name. Now, he lived in England and he was a personal friend of Queen Victoria. And because they were good friends and because of his status in England, what she would do is every year she would send Sir Montefiore a, a request for um, his, his accountings. And depending on how the coffers looked and depending what was going on, she would tax him personally. And so this year was no different. She sends him an accounting a request for accounting, and he sends her back a paper. She looks at it. She's shocked. He's my friend. I trust him. How can he lie to me? He, he must make at least 10 times this. Why is he sending me this accounting? She turns to her official. She says, go and seize this man's property and everything he owns and put him in dungeons until I can figure out what to do with him. When Queen Victoria calms down, she, they pull him out of the dungeons and she says, I don't understand. We're friends. How can you do this to me? I know you make a lot more than this. So Moses Montefiore turns to her and says, my dear queen, I didn't lie to you. What I sent to you on that paper were all of my charitable givings for this year. And the truth is, my dear queen, that in my Torah, my truth, my value, the money that we give to charity is all that's truly ours. And my dear queen, you just proved my Torah right because in one moment, you seized all my assets and threw me in dungeons. And all I had was the clothes on me for that moment. And you proved the Torah to be true, that all we have is what we give. So what is, what is money? We put so much value on it. We put so much attention. But I think that if there's one thing that this COVID can teach us, if there's one perspective that we can change, instead of focusing on money, focusing on life, think about it for a moment. If we just try tomorrow to replace any word that we would use for money with life, Time is life. Time is not money. Time is life. I'm going to go to work so I can make a better life for myself and my family. In my bank account, I have life. I have a means through which I can live my life. Try it for a bit. Anytime you want to use the word money, you can replace it with life or Alexandra just said you can replace it with action. So if you say something like money is so important, life is so important. I need money. I need life. Money makes the world go round. Life makes the world go round. We need to start changing our lingo. It's just the words. Words are tools the soul uses to express itself. 
That's why we have to be so careful with our words because they are part of our soul's expression. Our soul is trying to express itself. It's trying to tell us that we have to replace the word money with something more powerful. So a uh, story, the great Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, he lived in a town called Lubavitch. You may have heard that before. That's why often you'll hear it's called Chabad Lubavitch. Chabad is the philosophy and Lubavitch was the town where the rabbi had lived. And so people would come to the Lubavitch to ask this great rabbi for advice. One day a man came in, he owned a, uh, a galoshes factory, like he made boots. He starts off crying to the rabbi and he's saying how the factory is going down. It's taken a turn for the worse. And he starts going through all the details. Everything has been going on with this factory. It's terrible. You can't believe rabbi what's going on. The rabbi pauses a moment and takes a look at him. And he says, you know, I've heard of a foot in a boot, but I've never heard of a head in a boot. Where's our focus? We have money to live a better life. Let's go on to number three. I learned that money is a means, not an end. For years, we lived for money. We worked to earn it. And when that wasn't enough, we worked overtime or took a second job and spent anxious hours and sleepless nights to manage and grow it, quote unquote. We sacrificed everything, family, community, peace of mind for our money. And where's all that money now? It turns out that we never had it in the first place. It had us. We learned the hard way, but is there any other way to learn? That money is a tool for life not the other way around. There's this verse that says that God should bless that all that we do. And that's the understanding of it, that God is in control. That it says, it says, li v'zav li, that gold is mine and, and silver is mine. That money is one of those things. There's only two things in the entire Torah that God says is mine. And that is, interestingly enough, money and war. It says, Hashem ish Muhammad, that God, is, uh, it's, God is, is a man of war. The only two things, money and war. And ask, ask any person in sales. People in sales have the most faith. If they don't have faith, then... They have something, I don't know. You'll hear them saying funny words like, oh, it'll be better. Better for what? Better for the God you don't believe in? Well, what do you mean better? Oh, there'll be better times. I don't understand. Tonight, today, it's tough. But I'm sure there'll be better times. Who's going to prove that you're going to have better times? Just the idea of thinking towards the future for better times is a certain level of belief and faith. And then one day out of the blue, there's a call, right? There's a random call and it leads to someone that leads to someone else that leads to something else. And somehow you have a good month. People in sales, they know this. We have to believe in a higher power. We have to know that money belongs to God. That money does not belong to us. And we have to have faith in that power. The Torah says that God will give us what we need. People who have been given more money than what they need, the Torah says, they've been given it because God trusts them with it. And God knows that they're going to do the right thing with it. They've been trusted. The soul, in its form now, it could be the soul that came into this world and, and, and got a little dirty in this world. And it made 
some difficult choices, not the best choices, but that soul in its purest form came down into this world and God gave this soul more money than it needs. Why? So it can do good with that money. That's what the Torah says. Not because God trusts that soul with money. What's the proof? In the Torah, the manna. The manna, when the, when the Jews were in the desert for 40 years, it came down from heaven every single day. The right amount. You weren't allowed to, to save it, because if you saved it, it spoiled. You had to eat. You had to trust that tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and there's going to be more manna. Think about it a second. They had no other way of getting food in the desert. You had to trust. And on Friday, there were two portions of manna because on Shabbat, it wouldn't fall. That's why we have two loaves of bread, two chalas. Because of the two portions of manna that came on Friday. Think about it a second. Imagine you were there. You had to have absolute faith that tomorrow there'll be more manna. And that's the same exact thing with money. God started us off as a people like a child in a parent's home. A child doesn't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow for food. The parent worries about that. And God started us off the same way to teach us how we should use money, how we should respect money, how we should know that tomorrow there also be there will also be manna. And this leads me to number four. I learned that what we give is more ours than what we gain. The money that we make never truly belongs to us. It either disappears into thin air at some point or saps our strength and steals our lives. But every hour spent with our children, every dollar we give to charity, every positive endeavor we support, this can never be taken from us. They're ours forever. My favorite story, I have to tell this story. Again, if you've heard any of my Rosh Hashanah sermons or any of my classes, you've heard this story before, but this one never gets old. It was a story that was written up uh, in 2002 in the New York Times. A billionaire, I believe his name was, was Cohen. Sounds like a very Jewish name. Yeah. He leaves, uh, he, he dies. And this is the way that they wrote the story. And he leaves two wills. The first will was to be opened up the day that he died. And the second will was only to be opened up 30 days after he died. And so they open up his will. It's a very short will. It says, my dear children, if you go into my bedroom, and you look in my top drawer, you're gonna find a beautiful sterling silver case. And inside the sterling silver case is my favorite pair of socks. I wanna be buried in these socks. That was it. And so they go up into the house and they go into the room and they open the drawer and surely enough, they find the sterling silver case. And right in this case is a fresh pair of socks. They run to the funeral home with the pair of socks. And they say to the funeral director, Here's the will, the last will and testament of our dad. All he wants, the billionaire, is to be buried in these socks. Well, the director was Jewish, obviously. It was a Jewish funeral home. And if you know anything about Jewish burial, no one should ever know of it. But it's not possible to be buried in socks. We only use shrouds, usually linen shrouds. And uh, the funeral home didn't know what to do because there's a little as we say, a kvetch in the story, this Cohen actually was the, the primary benefactor of this funeral home. He started the funeral home and gave the money of, for the Chavar Kedisha. And so here was the man who actually gave the money to start this funeral home. And he had one last will and testament. Now, the kids were not religious. And the kids actually mocked religion. And so they said, look, our dad started this thing. 
the least you can do is honor his last will and testament. He just wants to be buried in his socks. And they didn't know what to do. They actually convened a rabbinical court of a rabbi from New York and a rabbi from Toronto and a rabbi from Israel. And they tried to figure out a way to do it. And they came, there was no way, because there really is no way. They, the, the kids were cursing out these stupid religious people. They don't know all they want. My father's thing, you know, he gave them all this money and they don't even respect his last will and testament. What kind of people are these people? Unbelievable. They ended up doing the burial and during the Shiva, all they were talking about was these stupid religious people and how they can't respect their father's last will and testament. 30 days go by and they open up the second will. And this will was the, the complete will. And it starts off like this. My dear children, by now you have discovered that I cannot be buried in my favorite pair of socks. Let this serve as a reminder to you that no matter how much wealth you build in this world, no matter what you accumulate in this world, at the end of your life, you can't even take a pair of socks. What do you do if you don't like your job? Ask yourself. What don't you like about your job? Do you stay there anyways? Do you tough it out? Maybe while you're there, you look for another job. You try to figure out some way of making your job better. The Mishnah and the ethics of our fathers and Pirkei Avot says something fascinating. It says, who is happy? We're actually going to talk about happiness next week, not a paid for advertisement. It says, who is happy? One who is happy with their lot. One who is happy with what they have. Who is happy? One who is happy with what they have. That is the Mishnah's definition of a happy person. Think about it a second. What, what is happiness? What are the things that are most important to us in our lives? Because the things in our life that are most important are the things that we don't like. I'm going to say this again. The things in your life that you don't like the most, says Kabbalah, are the things in your life that are most important. Your purpose in this world will be the toughest thing for you to do. If you think about that thing you hate the most, the hardest thing for you to do, that is a piece or maybe even the entire purpose for which you were created. Anyone that said that life is supposed to be easy, they're wrong. The purpose of being in this world was not to be easy. The purpose of being in this world, as we spoke about in the beginning of the class, is a struggle. Struggle is a Jewish value. We love to struggle. We say, bring it on, the more the better. We're great at struggle. We're great at guilt, but we're better at struggle. Guilt actually is just a coping mechanism for the struggle. <sighs> okay, I, I will, I will. <laughs> We've got COVID. We have enough, all right? Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I was going off on it. <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> we have no problem. Huh? I just said struggle is the gift. Yeah. We have no problem saying, when I was young, I used to walk to school barefoot, uphill, 
both ways in the snow while it was raining we love it we embrace it we, we joke about it because it's so important there's nothing more important you see all those stories that we were told were all our parents trying to teach us the value of struggle that that is the most important thing there's nothing more valuable than our struggle it's fascinating if you think about the most celebrated jewish holidays I mean, whatever was going to be in December was going to be popular. But outside of December, it's Passover and Yom Kippur, the two most difficult holidays. I mean, think about this a second. Someone should go over all to all those people who are cleaning like lunatics. I mean, if you're OCD, because you stand back before Passover because it's going to be insane. Or, or, or all, if you walk into a synagogue in Yom Kippur and you just smell it, the bad breath. Just walk over to those people and say, you know, there's a holiday in June, or this year at the end of May. And it's called, um, I won't tell you what it's called, but you know what we do on this holiday? We eat cheesecake. Yeah, we eat lots and lots of cheesecake. It is the least popular Jewish holiday. It's called Shavuot. Most people don't even know it exists. Can you imagine someone saying like, oh, where are you going for Shavuot? Oh yeah, I'm going to my mom's and uh, we're eating cheesecake. Lots of cheesecake. It's unbelievable. No one talks about it. No one ever heard about it. It's the easiest holiday, but the least celebrated. Which one is the most celebrated? The one that if you're OCD, forget about spring cleaning. The house is going to be finished. Every single crumb with a toothbrush the most difficult holidays are the most popular because that is our value because we love struggle and struggle is most important. We embrace it. We've come through so much and we're alive today and all the people that tried to destroy us are gone, but we're still here because we struggled and you know what? We'll do it again. We're doing it now. We'll do it again. Europe didn't work. All the survivors came to the new country. They were successful. Very few of the survivors were not successful. Some of them were successful beyond their wildest imagination because they understood the value of struggle. Because they understood the value of hard work. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't transfer that to us. And we've become accustomed to a certain lifestyle. We try our best to work as little as possible. Make the most money, right? They say, don't work harder, work smarter. You can work smarter, but for some things you have to work harder, like on ourselves, like on our relationships, like on the way we look at the world, like on what matters to our soul. You can't work smarter there. You have to work harder. In our studies, in our values, those are the things that we have to work harder and not smarter. Smart is good too, but struggle is even better. And this leads me to my last one. I learned the true meaning of financial security. For thousands of years, people got up in the morning, worked the land and toiled at their craft, collected a day's earnings or a season's harvest, and lived their lives. Their sense of security derived not from their bank accounts and stock portfolios, but from the confidence that the same God who created them and placed them upon this earth also provides their means of sustenance. There are no free lunches falling down from the heavens. After all, God created us to be his partners in the business of life, not freeloading guests. But if we do our part, God will do his. Life has become more complicated since those simple days, more sophisticated, and yes, more rewarding. Today, quote unquote, doing our part means not just getting a job, but also acquiring mortgages, insurance plans, retirement accounts, and a slew of other financial instruments. 
but the basic equation remains the same. We do our part to better God's world, and God does his part in providing us the means to do so. It is to this partnership with our creator that we have learned to look as our source of happiness, fulfillment, and security. It's been a tough year. We've gained far, far more than we've lost. I promise you, says Kabbalah, if you put in a finger, if you do your part, God will take care of you. Just make that shift. Make that conscious shift. That's not a scary thing, believe me. Whatever's been working till now probably hasn't been working. So it's going to be hard to make that shift if you want to. But if you just put in a finger, God will put in a hand. I'm not saying don't work. I'm saying you have to work. We have to struggle. We have to do our part. But when we do our part, God takes care of the rest. And this is how I want to end tonight. I want to end tonight with a very important Kabbalistic idea. The idea is called Orot and Kalim. It means light and vessels. So last week we started speaking for a moment about this idea that the world was created with light and vessels. Now I want to talk about how the vessels work in our life. You want a blessing? You want to know the, the, the Jewish secrets to making money? This is it. You want a blessing? You want a million dollars. What are you going to do with a million dollars? If somebody gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? It's communist Russia. So this guy comes to uh, a peasant and he says, the czar has a question for you, dear peasant. If you would have a hundred horses, stallions, would you give them to the czar? The peasant looks, stands up straight. He says, a hundred horses, stallions, strong and fast. I would give them to the czar. 70 stallions. If you had 70 stallions, would you give them to the czar? 70 stallions, I would give. 50. 50, of course. 40, of course. 20, of course. 10. The czar wants to know if you had 10 stallions, would you give them to the czar? Of course. The stallion over there in your backyard, the czar wants it. Oh, but that I have. A million dollars, what would you do with it? It's easy. You know, people win the lottery and then it's unbelievable. They can win millions of dollars and in a year or two, it's gone. Actually, most people who win the lottery and take the sum, it's finished within a year or two. They have stats on this. I don't know them offhand. So here's a very important idea that Kabbalah is going to teach us that we can use in every day of our life. Something that's called a vessel. Now, I have a cup here, nice glass cup. And in this cup is, uh, is water. Now, if I'm gonna take my, my seltzer bottle and I'm gonna pour more water. Now, let's say I wanted to pour the entire liter into this cup. Will this cup hold an entire liter of water? I think it's about 10 ounces, this cup. Will it hold a liter of water? It's gonna overflow. Majority of our cups, what we call our vessels are filled with garbage. There's no place for anything new because we're keeping mental, emotional, and physical garbage in our life. Kabbalah says, Orot and Kalim, the light can only shine as much. The light is unlimited. God's is infinite light. But in order to create this world, God had to condense that light called simsum. Condense and condense and condense and condense until it came into this world. This world is the vessel. Now in our personal world, we also have vessels. So we actually can tap in to that infinite light, the infinite or the light, but we can only accept as much as our vessel can handle. So if our vessel is full of stuff, it can't handle anything else. So what do we do? How do you make space in the vessel for money or for blessing? You have to empty the vessel. 
oh, so you're going to say that's very nice, Rabbi. Well, how beautiful. How do I empty my vessel? So it's simple. It's spring. Finally, start by getting rid of the garbage in your life. We have time now. Just get rid of stuff. It's pretty obvious. Garbage is garbage. What is garbage? Garbage is stagnant. Anything that doesn't move, anything that doesn't have a life of its own, it doesn't have its own purpose, is garbage. That stuff that you're struggling with, it's garbage. Sometimes it's fighting back. Well, you don't get rid of it because usually we don't have enough energy or time to deal with it. Deal with it. Now is the time. We have time. It's time is to get rid of all of our physical garbage, but more importantly, our emotional garbage and our mental garbage, everything. We have to get rid of all the garbage. So the more we're going to empty our vessels, the more we're going to have space for something new. Just think about it a moment. If there's one thing you can do tonight is just make a list of two or three things. Physical is obvious, but emotionally that you need to get rid of. Just jot it down quickly. Something, somebody that you want to connect with, somebody you need to forgive. I have a whole thing, a whole lesson on the Kabbalah of forgiveness. If you haven't heard it, I encourage you to listen to it. I'll send it to you if you need it. Something that life is too short to hold on to. Whatever experience happened that you've just been holding on to and it's taking you over. Now is the time. And you know what's interesting? People who maybe we've wronged, for some reason, there's just this opening in the world right now. We really have this unique opening that people are just easier, like, oh, wow. Oh, so nice of you to reach out. People are wanting it. They're, they're craving it. So if, you, if you're saying, oh, well, that happened 20 years ago. How can I deal with it now? Now is a really good time. And I don't know if we're ever going to have this time again. It's a real gift that's been given to us. If you need help to classify it and to empty it, maybe, you know, if you have specific questions, we can talk about them after the class or you can, we can talk about them privately if you want. But just think of those things right now that if we want money, if we really think that we deserve it and we're not getting it, it means that there's something else in its place. There's something else taking up its space. And if we want to have a vessel that can hold it, we have to empty it. That's it. You can drink it up, and then it makes space for more in the metaphor. There's so many different ways of getting rid of it. But usually it's just garbage and you have to dump it out. So those are my five things I learned about money. And um, that's my thoughts for tonight. And I would love to continue this conversation and uh, hear what you have to say. And let's take it from there.